Thank you so much. Um, well, that, I really appreciate the generous introduction. It's great to be with you all. For, uh, show of hands, who's within like their first three weeks or so of being at UVA? Great. Welcome. Thrilled you're here. I hope I get to engage with you again in courses or at Batten. I'm going to give you the 20, 30 second, slightly unvarnished, more unvarnished history of, uh, or I guess my bio, starting with when I was sitting in a room just like this. I went to Brown University undergrad. Some of you might have looked at Brown or know people at Brown. Um, no requirements, right? No curricular requirements. And so I was a first year student and I was like, this is great. No one's telling me what I have to do. I'm going to play a lot of Ultimate Frisbee, um, which was maybe not the best thing to advance towards any kind of career. It was a lot of fun. I might still be playing Ultimate Frisbee and working odd jobs were it not for two, um, two real pivotal events in my life. One was meeting a professor, Harold Ward, who provided tremendous mentorship and said, like, you could play Ultimate Frisbee or you could actually be a little more focused and let me help you be more focused. And two, I had the opportunity to join a mentoring program at a local high school um, in Rhode Island and realized that I had a real passion for working in education. And I went on to teach and be an administrator. Um, and by virtue of a lot of those experiences, went back to graduate school now have the real privilege of being a colleague of Eileen's. Um, I run a lab that focuses on designing and testing strategies to improve educational workforce outcomes for low-income students, um, and then get to partner with a lot of tremendous public agencies and organizations, the Obamas, as Eileen mentioned, the US Army, and others. This is all to say, you're in your first few weeks here. If you don't feel like you have it figured out what you're going to do, and you're looking around, you're like, all these other people know um, what they're going to do, where college is going to take them, it's not true. The first few weeks, the first few months of college, maybe in the first year or two, are about that inquiry. To find the passion, career, and avocational, that will carry you forward. And hopefully this showcase gives you some insights on what that path might be. And I and Eileen and others are here to be a source of mentorship and support as you find and question um, and pursue whatever path is going to lead you to and, and through and beyond UVA. Let's move on to the topic at hand. Who can tell me what this is? Please, and say your name if you don't mind. RJ. RJ, great. Okay, great. Thanks. RJ got us started. We're at least in the right like, realm. Who can go a little further than RJ and tell me what kind of car this is? Please, in your name. Model T-ish, right? I don't actually know. We're going to call it a Model T. Maybe it's the Model Y or B or something. What about this is innovative? What about the Model something is innovative? Your name? Jackson, great. Okay, so that's, you're on the right track. It's designed for a broader audience, what about that design process, in, what about the design process enabled broader distribution? Yeah, great. So the Model T was one of the first kind of broad consumer products, in this case of a car, that used this assembly line procedure that then kind of factored into a lot of different production, right? One of my favorite quotes as it relates to innovation, which is something I, I focus on in my research and teaching, is something uh, that's attributed to Henry Ford. And, and someone asked him, um, you know, what motivated you to build the Model T? Were people asking for cars? Were they seeing cars? And he said, no, people wanted faster horses. If you ask people what they want in terms of transportation, they wanted a horse that could go 12 miles an hour, not 10 miles an hour. No one was thinking they wanted a car. It took an innovator like Henry Ford and his many colleagues, I'm sure, to think disruptively and introduce an innovation that no one would have identified as something they needed or wanted. But as soon as it kind of hit the market, all of a sudden, this was something that was changing people's lives in ways that were good. And as we're seeing 100 plus years after with climate change also had unintended consequences. What about this is innovative? Please, your name? Great. When I give this talk to people more my age, as soon as I ask what's innovative, everyone's hand goes up. And they immediately point to the wheels. That's just right. Because like me, 
Older people have a memory of dragging suitcases through the airport when there were no wheels. And it was a real pain, especially if you're running to get a flight. It took someone to say, look, we could just screw a few wheels on. It would make it way easier to get through the airport. And the point is that sometimes innovations don't have to be tremendously disruptive. Sometimes they're slight modifications to things we use every day, but they make our lives easier or better. Um, when I teach about innovation, I always use this working definition. And so it's what I'll use for our shorter time together today. I, I should also say, now, all the way through the 40 minutes or so we have together, jump in with questions, reactions, disagreements. I invite your full candor and engagement um, uh, uh, with anything that I, that I talk through. So innovation, a new approach designed to improve upon the status quo and generate improved experiences or outcomes for people. Um, and my particular focus uh, in my class, in my teaching, in my research, is on innovations that have a specific focus on addressing inequalities in society. So there's lots of innovations that just make profit for companies, or that might serve a small segment of society, or maybe even exacerbate inequities. My particular focus on innovation is innovations, you know, policy innovations, or private sector innovations that can be applied in the public sector that have the opportunity and potential to reduce inequality and improve mobility. Um, we'll come back to this in a minute. Lots of innovations have great designs and even great intent. Whether they work in the way they're intended or as effectively as intended is a separate question, and we'll come back to that. Um, and so now I'm going to turn from a kind of general concept of innovation to making the case for why we need innovation to improve youth outcomes in particular. Uh, and I'm going to first ask you to talk to a neighbor and try to make sense of what is in this plot. Um, and so just to kind of give you the general context, these are results from a national assessment. Some of you might have taken it um, of educational progress. This is administered every few years. It has been for decades. And the way this test is designed is to allow comparability over time. So we can look at eighth grade results in 2018 and compare them to eighth graders from 2014. And we can do the same for fourth grade, 12th grade, math, reading, et cetera. So turn to a neighbor, talk for a minute of what you see in this data and what your impressions are. Um, there's no right or wrong here, uh, just your initial impressions based on this plot. I'll give you just you know, 20, 30 seconds. Okay, I'm gonna pull you back together. Um, great to hear so many conversations. So who wants to share at least one impression? There's lots of things we could take from this. What's at least one impression? And if you see me overlooking you, other professors may have done this, it's probably because you've participated before. One of my core values as a faculty member is to try to have as broad and inclusive engagement as possible. Um, so that's, that's the reason why. I saw, I think, your hand? Okay, so great, and sorry, your name? Bryn. Bryn? Yeah, so Bryn and, 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 and friends made the observation that, um, that performance seems to improve, and I uh, assume what you were looking at is kind of the share that were, say, below the proficient line versus the share above, and there's many more, or there's a substantial increase in the share that are above this proficiency standard. Okay, great, please. Yeah, so often when we're looking at data relating to you know, education policy, public policy, over time, there often are these dual stories. Oftentimes we do see progress, and that's something that's good and that we should celebrate. It's not always the case, but often we do see progress. And at the same time, there's, clearly, there's often clear signals that we have more work to do. And I think Eliza's, Eliza, is that right? um, Eliza and Bryn's point both hold. On the one hand, students in Virginia are performing better over time. On the other hand, as of 2019, 
um, you still have, what, over 60% of students who at least based on this test's benchmarks are below a proficient level. And I think, you know, to me that suggests we still have work to do and we still need creative ways to improve achievement. Now take a minute, and I've, I've kind of drawn your attention visually to a couple data points in particular. Take another 30 seconds, talk to the same neighbors. What, do you, uh, what are your impressions from this um, table, which is same, this is focusing on 2019 in Virginia, eighth grade math. What are the impressions that stand out to you here? 20 or 30 seconds. Okay, I'm going to pull you together again. Fantastic to see people wrestling and talking with data. Um, that's something you could do a lot of at Batten if you decide to pursue uh, Batten courses further. So who wants to share an impression? Please. Um, Your name? Yeah, Gra actually it's a, it's a well, um, I think the relationship would actually go differently and, and I should provide a little bit of context. The, so this is on me. The National School Lunch Program is often used as a proxy within education or education policy for income or family resources. So in order to qualify for free lunch at schools or reduced price lunch, not in every community, but in many communities, Families have to submit information about their income. And so you get free or reduced price lunch if your family is below a certain income level. Um, and so one of the, uh, related to what Ryan's point is, is that the proficiency levels for students from lower income versus you know, middle or higher income backgrounds, there's tremendous disparity. Um, you know, 50, near 50% 50 for students who are not eligible, only 19%. Ryan's point is an interesting one of how providing nutritional support might affect achievement. Um, and what we'd want to compare there is students who all are eligible, some of whom get free or reduced lunch and others don't. And there's actually, happy to talk with any of you about this, some really interesting research showing that if you provide better and more nutrition in schools, students perform better. So really great insight into that point. Other observations? Please. Hi, Reese. So like, uh, there's a higher percentage of white students who are actually performing nutrition in the food than the black students. Yep. So this is, you know, for me, one of just many motivating indicators for why when we think about innovation, my position is we have to have an equity lens. We have to have an inequality and a mobility lens because of the extent of disparities that persist into 2019 and frankly have just gotten worse since the pandemic. And many of you may have observed that or experienced it um, in your own lives or in communities. And so that's the, for me, additional motivation. It's not just that we have more to do for everyone in terms of improving achievement levels. We have a particular mandate, in my view, a moral imperative um, to do more to reduce inequalities and, and, and expand opportunities for all students. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple broad categories of innovation that I think are really promising and interesting. And then I'm going to go a little deeper into one case study. Um, and so what this is diving a little deeper is into early education. Um, and this is showing similar relationships um, of even before schools start, how much achievement gaps lag um, um, uh, by students of different groups. So these are months of learning um, for in math and reading for African American or Hispanic students relative to white students and low income students relative to higher income students. This is before formal schooling has even started. 
right? This isn't after students have had a few years in the classroom when disparities could arise or could be lessened. This is going into school. There are already months worth of difference in students' math and reading achievement. So addressing innovation isn't just about, for instance, something I focus a lot about, uh, increasing college affordability for more Americans. Addressing inequality and finding innovative approaches to do so is imperative when kids are very early uh, in their lives, even before formal schooling. The good news is we have some really promising strategies to do so. Um, one of my favorite examples is a program called Reach Out and Read. So one of the challenges with improving, say, early literacy is how do we get books? How do we get early literacy strategies to families that might not have access to libraries, might not have the financial resources to purchase books on their own, may have very limited time to read or practice reading with their kids. Uh, it can be hard to go into communities and reach families. And so what some researchers did is say, well, you know, most families at some point take their kid to the doctor. And so rather than going out into communities to find people, let's meet families where they are. Let's give doctors books. Um, let's give them uh, early literacy strategies, um, and let's see how that affects students' literacy development. And this was studied through a randomized trial. I'll, I'll come back to evidence in a moment. Um, and doing that led students whose family, young children whose families got access to this literary instruction to do better um, in terms of their early literacy. A more technological approach to this um, was using text messaging. This was a project in San Francisco where um, the city and some researchers enrolled families with young children <coughs> into a text campaign, and parents received three texts a week. You can see an example here. Uh, there's a tip on Wednesday. Say two words to your child that start with the same sound, like happy and healthy. Can you see, hear the, the sound in happy and healthy? So like really straightforward, you're giving your kid a bath, you're feeding them a meal, you're getting them dressed. You get this text, you look at your phone because it chirps or vibrates, and you're like, oh, I can do this, it takes 20 seconds. Um, they sent these messages over the course of a few months, and kids whose parents got these texts were doing substantially better. So sometimes innovation can be about meeting families where they are. Sometimes it can be using technology to reach out and provide a just-in-time um, strategy that people can use. And sometimes uh, we try to innovate at the policy level. I think it was 2013, President, then President Obama made a focus of his State of the Union on changing policy so that all children could participate in high quality preschool. That has not yet happened at the federal level, but several states have, several cities have, and that's led to substantial improvements in students' <coughs> academic performance. In the same way that we need um, innovation in early education, lots of indications that we need it in K-12, um, without going into the details just so I can move into the case study, um, lots of achievement gaps that persist not just early in schools, but throughout schools. Um, and a lot of innovation in this space to reduce these inequities. So anyone by chance go to a KIPP school? Okay, so KIPP, uh, how about anyone go to a charter school? Okay, um, KIPP is one example of a charter school um, that has implemented a variety of design features aimed at dramatically improving students' achievement. Longer school days, longer school years, more rigorous academic expectations, more rigorous training for teachers, um, a lot of kind of very, very early planning for life after high school. And students who attend these schools um, do substantially better in middle school, in high school, even after high school than students who don't. I imagine what for a lot of you was probably didn't seem like an innovation. It was just core to your K-12 experience. It was kind of the role of both technology um, in the classroom, so tablets, computers, but also adaptive learning, right? You take um, some kind of math assessment on a computer, based on how you do, you get assigned problems that are more or less complex. Please. I have a question on Yasser. Hi, Yasser. Yeah, sorry. Thanks, Yasser. These are the kind of gap in um, test performance between families at the 90th percentile of the income distribution and the 10th, or the 75th and the 25th. Um, and basically, going back to the 1950s, these gaps, so this line is relative to itself. This is the, the, the gap between fam kids from families at the 90th and 10th percent of the distribution. It's over a standard deviation in performance. Um, so that hasn't changed a whole lot, nor has the gap between 
students from families at the 75th and 25th percent of the income distribution. The main takeaway is these gaps by income in academic performance um, at different grade levels is equivalent to about three to four years of learning. So really pronounced gaps in academic achievement. Um, yeah, thanks for asking the question. Um, but a lot of attempts to adapt learning using technology in the way that a really good teacher would do but might not have time, trying to use software. When I teach about technology in the classroom and adaptive learning in my, in my um, spring innovation course, we spent a lot of time discussing in what ways technology was beneficial for students' learning and in what ways it was a waste of time or maybe even detracted from otherwise productive learning. So I'm curious, when you think back for a moment, you know, whether it's 12th grade, 10th grade, or earlier, what are your own reflections on the kind of presence of technology or adaptive learning in your education? Did it net add value? Were there ways that it, it detracted? I'm going to wait, Eliza, just to get other people involved. Please. I'm Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Got it. Um, so on the one hand, maybe in principle, a tablet lets someone engage with content, or you know, people all over the world, they wouldn't. On the one hand, maybe this adaptive learning um, uh, allows for more personalized instruction. But once we put a device in front of someone, especially a young person, um, maybe focusing on what are intended to be the instructional and learning benefits is hard to weigh against the immediate distractions that are on that same device. That's a really core issue. Um, thanks for bringing that. Please. Your name, sorry. Kate. Mm -hmm. So uh, thanks so much for bringing that, Kate, you said, right? Um, I, uh, I mentioned I'll, I teach this undergraduate class on, on innovation. Um, the first year I taught it, I didn't think to say anything about technology. And I noticed that a lot of people were on computers, tablets, phones. And I'd start to you know, walk around the room like this, not to spy on people, just to kind of glance and see what they were doing. And most of it wasn't course readings, right? <laughs> or like you know, fi going to find more about this. It was whatever, social media or other things. And I, the next semester, 2015, 2016, ever since, I don't allow technology in the classroom. And I'll buy notebooks or pencils or pens for anyone who needs it, but for that very reason. And I found the level of engagement uh, was much higher. We, we bring in a lot of guest speakers, guest innovators to the class. And so the engagement among students and the innovators is much higher when there's not technology as, um, as a barrier. That being said, technology certainly has the potential to bring a lot of assets to the classroom and to learning. How we balance those is one of the challenges with, like, with any innovation. Um, so up till now, I've been kind of alluding to different approaches to innovation. A question that I wrestle with and that I think is really important to think about um, is which innovations actually work. This is me 20 years ago as a high school teacher. Uh, and I had the privilege of working at a really innovative high school. Our students, public high school, kind of like a charter school, um, students spent two days a week starting in ninth grade at internships out in the community. They worked on, they got their academics through projects at their internship. They didn't get grades every quarter. They had to give a public exhibition of the work they had done to their mentors, their teachers, their family members. Um, and to be accountable for if they had kind of screwed off and not done anything. So really, really innovative model. But I found myself asking as a teacher, well, what about the fact that they're not really getting a lot of acad core academic content? What will happen when they go on to college? Um, or what are the benefits of having these really adult relationships um, early in life? How does that affect the way they engage with college professors or in jobs? But questions that couldn't separate, right? This is a complicated model, and we didn't have a really a comparison. Um, most innovation that happens in the public sector, certainly in education, we don't know whether it works or not. It's not rigorously evaluated. And to add a further sobering um, 
piece of information of innovations or practices, even established practices that get rigorously evaluated, most of them are ineffective. So this is showing um, 90 studies that were rigorously, 90 different programs or interventions or innovations rigorously evaluated and funded by the United States Department of Education. And to get the Department of Education funding, you have to use the most kind of rigorous methods to isolate the unique impact of a program or a policy. 90% um, of them, or I guess not 90%, approaching 90%, 85% of them had no effect or a very small effect. That's not to say that we shouldn't innovate. It's to say that it's really, really important that we evaluate innovations, find the ones that work, so that for the scarce dollars that we have to invest in education, we're directing them towards effective practices. And so I'm going to turn to a case study in the 20 minutes we have on my own kind of journey with developing innovations, testing innovations, and, and kind of how that, how that has developed. Um, much of my work early focused on this phenomenon of summer melt, and some of you may, this may be very fresh um, and salient for. Um, and so I'll turn to you in a minute, but what the percentages are showing here is the share of high school seniors who've done everything they're supposed to to pursue college. They've done well in high school, they've applied to college, they've gotten in, they've applied for financial aid if their families have needed it, They've even, as of the end of high school, I went to school in New England, we graduated like late June, chose what college they were going to attend. I'm going to go to UVA, I'm going to go to UConn, wherever. These are the percentage of students who didn't enroll anywhere in the year after high school. So one out of five in Providence, one out of three in uh, Philly, approaching one out of five in Fort Worth, Texas. Please. they not only get in, they've indicated, I plan to go to a specific institution, either through a financial commitment or through a, a deposit waiver or some other means of commitment. This is our summer melt, right? This is between high school graduation and the start of the fall semester. What these percentages also mask is substantial income or socioeconomic disparity in the probability of melt. Fulton County, Georgia, among those students who don't qualify for free or reduced price lunch, middle income or higher, melt rate's low, like 7%. And some of those students are taking gap years or doing things between college. Among students who do qualify for free or reduced price lunch, so students from lower income backgrounds, the melt rate is three or four times as high. One in three students doesn't enroll. They've done the same things. They've gotten into college, they've chosen where to go, but they failed to enroll. And as we start to dig into this more, maybe underlying your questions, like why would this happen? What can arise between high school graduation and the start of college that could lead a student who really wanted to go and got in from actually enrolling? And this is the part where you all may have different <coughs> degrees of kind of relatability. Um, there is a whole host of financial and procedural tasks that students have to complete and their families have to complete after high school graduation and before college in order to successfully matriculate. So on the financial side, students need to have done their FAFSA to get aid, right? Um, some of them might have been asked to verify their income and asset information by the federal government. That might not happen, depending on when students start the process, until after high school. Um, so it might delay when students get their award letters. Students have to make sense of different loan options, set up tuition payment plans. Again, all things that you relate to uh, or some of you may relate to. And then on top of that, there's a whole host of procedural tasks. Signing up for orientation, paying for an orientation, taking placement tests, depending on what college or university one's going to, applying for housing, paying for a housing application, figuring out health insurance, um, figuring out transportation. All of these issues arise when students are no longer at their high school, and in many communities, high school counselors don't work during the summer months. Students have yet to engage with the resources at their college, and depending on a student's familial or community or neighborhood background, they may not have close uh, family members, mentors, sources of guidance who've gone through the same process who can they, they can rely on. So I'm curious, as much as you're comfortable sharing and nothing beyond that, when you think about this past summer, were there challenges that you encountered that you're all here, that's the good news, but that you didn't anticipate or that were stressful and made it hard 
for you and your family to kind of get every, all the pieces in place. RJ, I'm just going to hold for one moment, see if others want to jump in. Please. From Boston? Or Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that, Tara. And I think that's a lot of students' experience. I imagine maybe you or a family member or a counselor at least pointed you to the website. A lot of this is when I was doing this work, this is like you know, 10, 10 or so years ago. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to this in a minute. Um, a lot of students we talked to hadn't known to check their college website. And so if they'd gone to the admitted students page, they would have seen the checklist. But no one reminded them to, or maybe there was a note in their acceptance package. They were so excited about being accepted, they didn't see that part, and they didn't realize, they didn't have the, the kind of prior experience to check for this checklist. And all of a sudden, late July rolls around, and there's all these things to do. Thanks so much for sharing that. Do you have your hand up? What's your name? Sam. Sam. Yeah. Great. And so that's a great point. Universities like the University of Virginia, and we're fortunate in this way, um, have the resources to invest in staff and outreach to try and get students, to support students through these processes. Um, many of the more broad access institutions, community colleges, less selective four-year colleges and universities, have many fewer resources. They don't have generous alumni donors. They're not receiving nearly the level of public financial support they were. And so um, many times they don't have the same resources to, to outreach. Or as you'll see in a minute, they're using outreach channels that may not be as effective at reaching families. So I think it varies a lot. Um, places like UVA have a tremendous amount of resources to support their students, but the UVAs and the Harvards and the Browns of the world account for a very small fraction of kind of all college going students. Okay. I job to the campus of four of them at Canada. Uh huh. The universities there, I don't think, have the same level of like enthusiasm. Yep. So, like this summer, it was overwhelming for me as someone who's already done this process because I was working, you know, 40 hours a week on an internship. And the last thing I want to do is spend two hours in this, like, alpha awareness. Right. Like, on your campus. Uh huh. Right. Really yeah. What's your name? I'm Kate. Kate. You make a really interesting point where like, colleges ha genuinely have all the best intentions in providing these additional trainings and orientation support. They are an administrative and time burden. And I, I don't know how much evidence we have on how effectively they support students to make more informed decisions around alcohol. Right? We do them. Do they work is a separate question. And the time and administrative burdens are real. They create stress. They make it harder to do the other things you want to do. Um, and are they effective? I, I don't, I'm by no means, uh, and I have no basis to criticize any of UVA-specific additions, but there are potential trade-offs anytime we add a new thing. I want to keep going. You're, you're all offering fantastic perspectives. Um, so what might we do about Summer Melt? One of my first uh, in experiences with designing and, and kind of getting funding for and testing my own innovation was a text messaging campaign. Um, we worked with um, some school districts and nonprofits in the Boston area um, to send text messages to students over the summer to remind them of tasks they had to complete. This is back in the early 2010s when people weren't texting as much and like reaching out with information about what you had to do for college via text, believe it or not, was kind of novel. Um, this was not a text every day. This is about 10 texts over the summer. And this had a little bit of like a data science light component to it. We got information from our partners about where students were intending to go to school. So it'd say RJ's planning to go to UVA and Sam's planning to go to Tech or wherever. Um, and then we just literally went onto the college websites, like Tara mentioned, and pulled down all the tasks that students had to complete, put those two spreadsheets together, and automated this kind of information going out. So this is an example, highly personalized to Alex. Have you signed up for the UMass Boston orientation? 
Last one's July 15th. If you need to register, you can do it from your phone. And if you need help, you can reply and talk to an advisor. Um, from a, sorry, um, from a, a kind of theoretical or an empirical background, like why might we think text messages would be effective? Well, even though each message um, has a very little bit of information, there's kind of a few, a few kind of evidence-based reasons why we thought these could be effective. Especially then when text volume was a lot lower, every time our phone goes off, uh, we get a text, our phone tells us, right? It vibrates, it chirps, and for that moment in time, it captures our attention. Attention capture is really important when you want someone to know about something. And even in the early 2010s, lots of people had phones. They just were te getting texts from friends and family or work, not from their college, not from their high school for the most part. It, by virtue then of text being much shorter, like literally um, you could only send a text of 160 characters, uh, at least in an automated way. So it forced us as innovators to consolidate complex information into really timely, uh, simple bursts. And so we could say, like, you have to do FAFSA or you have to do a placement test. But we had to make it short. It was easy for a young person to digest. Um, just by, by sending these texts once a week, we're keeping it top of mind. So right, if you're at an internship, you're working, you're spending time with friends, it's easy and natural and common to put something off. Um, if all I did was text Eileen the word FAFSA once a week, for 10 days, she's less likely to put it off. And really importantly, text made it really easy for someone to get help. They didn't have to go into school building, find a community organization, pick up the phone. They could just write back to the text and get assistance. We evaluated this through a randomized trial, meaning like with a COVID vaccine, we randomly assigned some recent high school graduates to get these texts and others not. Not because we wanted to deny a potentially beneficial service to some students, but because we wanted to isolate the unique effect that getting these texts might have on students college going separate from all of the other factors that might affect how someone does in college. And what we found um, in the summer melt campaign, other work we did around FAFSA completion or FAFSA renewal is you know, several percentage point increases in the probability of students going to college from a handful of texts. So it costs what, a couple bucks to send a summer's worth of text. We're increasing college going or college persistence by a meaningful margin. At the time, that felt like a kind of win from an innovative perspective. And from a policy perspective, um, there was very broad and rapid adoption of this strategy that far outpaced our efforts. Eileen is way better at this, and so are a lot of my other colleagues. Um, I'm not like particularly um, uh, good at engaging reporters. I'm not on any social media, so I can't use that. Um, but this set of results just kind of got organic interest. And all of a sudden, whole states were adopting text campaigns, like sending it to all of their seniors. Uh, former First Lady built this campaign. And there's several reasons for that, right? Policymakers like low cost. They like strategies that are scalable. Uh, and I'd be interested on, on Eileen's view on this, I think, and others. There's a, like appeal to things that are shiny and new. Um, that, that, you know, leads to more investment. And so we got asked to do a fair amount of partnership with states, with national organizations, um, to implement these, these text campaigns at broader scale. And my deal, like I, I'm an empiricist at heart, I'm a researcher, I want to know, do things work? Um, so we said, sure, we'll work with you so long as we still get to do randomized trials. So now our randomized trials, a few years later, are coming from National, text coming from national organizations or state agencies. Um, the scale is much larger, tens or hundreds of thousands of students. We have to make some trade-offs with the innovation, right? When we were doing this at the level of Boston with a few high schools and nonprofits, we could find out where every student planned to go to college. We could look up on their college websites what they had to do. At a whole state level, at a national level, we didn't know how to do that. Maybe there's a way to scrape that information now. So the content was more uniform. By virtue of messaging hundreds of thousands of students, we didn't have the money to pay enough counselors to respond. So it was much more one-way content. And what we found, whether these were texts coming from the Common App, from a large state agency, the College Board, the US Army, a federal agency, no effect across lots of replications of this texting campaign when implemented at a larger scale. Wasn't my favorite couple of years as a, as a professor to take something that I 
spent a lot of time, poured a lot of energy to that I thought was leading to better outcomes for people, only to replicate and find that it wasn't working. But as a scientist, I think that's really important. Um, and I think there are implications for innovation more broadly. We, testing is essential. We can't, in my view, just innovate. Um, an innovation might have a really compelling design, seem like it should work. That doesn't mean it will work. And as a plug for Batten, um, I don't personally teach these courses, but we have colleagues that do a fantastic job equipping students, undergraduate and graduate, with skills to rigorously evaluate policies and programs to determine what works, what deserves scarce public and private funding. I think another implication is that replication is essential. Just because an innovation works in one setting doesn't mean it will work in all settings, doesn't mean it will work at larger scale. And I think a lot of innovations do an initial RCT, do an initial test, find it works, fly the mission accomplished banner, and bring it to scale without that ongoing testing and inquiry. And then finally, um, just because something doesn't replicate, in my view, doesn't mean we should give up. It means we have to figure out how to do better. And to me, that's a kind of the concept of a post-mortem. If an innovation doesn't work initially, it doesn't replicate, why? What could we do differently? And so that's a lot of what I focus on now. I'll just give you, in the four minutes or so, we have a few examples. And a lot of this is ongoing work. So if you're interested in getting engaged, you want to learn more, I'll put my email up. Um, and happy to connect with any of you. Uh, so first is getting to the question of why didn't these nudges that really were effective across multiple replications at small scale, why weren't they effective at broader scale? So there's a few hypotheses. One is that texting has just become way more saturated as a channel, right? I imagine you get texts all the time from all kinds of entities, UVA, maybe still from your high school, political campaigns you might be connected to. I get these all the time. Um, and the more that we get these, the more we might just tune this out and be on WhatsApp or other channels. Um, the other, this is a slightly more technical point, but in our, when we were doing this in the early 2010s, we were texting students with information about college, and I don't think they were getting that proactive outreach from many other sources. Maybe if they were going to UVA, not if they were going to Bunker Hill, unfortunately, a community college in the Boston area. But now, maybe there's just a lot more information flowing about college. Maybe colleges are better, to Sam's point, about emailing this out, about pushing out the websites. So the marginal value of a text message may be smaller. And if that's the case, if the marginal value of whatever innovation we're testing is smaller, it's, we're not going to find that it's effective. And as I alluded to, there's some important differences in how we implemented. Um, one versus two-way texting, more uniform content. And so that's, for us, pointed to some potential solutions. One is how to make these nudges more high impact. But I'm going to skip over that in the interest of time um, and, and talk about two others. Um, I, uh, despite having done a lot with technology, have really come to believe, this is not like a particularly original insight, but I've really come to believe in the power of ongoing sustained human assistance as people navigate complex challenges in their lives. Now, I focus particular on challenges as they relate to um, going to college, staying in college, finding a job. But there's lots of other complex challenges, right? If, you need at a, if you're at a point in your life and you need to access public benefits in order to have nutritional support or financial support, that's a complex process, right? If you or someone in your family is sick or unwell and needs to access health care, that can be complex for too many people. If you lose a job and you need unemployment benefits, in many places that remains complex. Um, in many settings, we've kind of automated or turned to kind of technology to help people. And we have a new colleague at, at Batten, Derek Wu, who does really fascinating work on the implications of automation um, for how people access benefits. That I definitely encourage you to connect with Derek and read about his work. In the context of college advising, um, we've had the opportunity to do long-term randomized trials of intensive advising programs that don't just send a set of texts. They meet with students one-on-one -on -one starting junior year or senior year of high school, and they meet with them and engage with students on all aspects of the college and financial aid process all the way through high school. This, there's a program called Bottom Line, operates in Boston, it operates in New York, that provides 10 to 15 hours of one-on-one -on -one support just during senior year and 
meets with students during college. Um, students who participate in bottom line were six percentage points. Um, and that's, you know, a 25 per relative percent <coughs> increase, more likely to get a bachelor's degree within four years because they had that one-on-one -on -one support. So I think one way, one of my post-mortem conclusions is that, personally, I believe we have to figure out how to bring informed, caring human resources front and center and to sustain those to help people navigate complex lives. Technology alone is probably not sufficient. And I believe there's ways that we can leverage cutting edge tools and strategies to provide students directly or the counselors and teachers working with them with highly tailored information. And so we're doing a lot of work taking the underlying machine learning methods that Netflix or Spotify use to tell you what movies to watch, um, what music to listen to, to provide students with really personalized information about courses they can take that position them for academic success, um, jobs that are open that align with their program of study, and so on. So just in conclusion, I hope I've made the case and motivated that there's tremendous need for innovation to improve youth outcomes, especially to reduce inequality. There's a lot of innovation that already happens, much less evidence of what works. And effective innovations, I believe, are ones that have compelling design, rigorously test that, replicate across scale, across communities, conduct postmortems if they don't work, and continue to innovate. And I think as you're thinking about how you want to use your time at UVA, whether it's in the private sector or the public sector, there is opportunity to contribute and design and test and scale and implement innovation um, to reduce inequality, to improve mobility in education and beyond. If you want to learn more, I teach a class um, that spends a semester on this. And most importantly, isn't listening to me. It's much of the class is built around hearing innovators out in the world come to class and talk about their innovation, wrestle with success and challenge. Um, that's spring 2023. Here's my email. I'd be happy to engage with any of you. Eileen, thank you so much for the chance to be here. And thanks to all of you for your engagement. <laughs>